The Future Sound Project Podcast. Hello, we are back. Episode two, the Future Sound Project. I'm Tom with my brother Jay, and yep. hello, and we're going to talk all about how to run a show. How to run a show. So we've got the guests of we've got Teeks, um, freelance uh, rep, tour manager as well. We've got Tommy Greaves, Birmingham based promoter, also in uh, Birmingham band, the New Righteous Mood. And we're going to be talking all that through. Um, we realised, didn't we, after podcast one, Jay, that we actually didn't explain um, who we are, really, or uh, why we're doing it. So, yeah, do you want to introduce us, Joe? Yeah, so uh, obviously, as Tom said, we're brothers. We run um, Birmingham-based, I suppose, um, promoting company, um, The Future Sound Project. Uh, and we promote shows across Birmingham, Coventry, Wolverhampton, uh, and anywhere else that would like to have us. Um, obviously, as you probably heard in episode one, we used to be in bands ourselves, started to promote um, in Wolverhampton, moved over to Birmingham, and kind of our ethos as a, as, as a company is about developing um, new or young uh, artists, whichever way you want to uh, phrase that, and uh, helping them to get to a stage where they can develop and develop and develop and fulfil their potential. Um, and so... Uh, that's what we're about, and obviously the podcast is something new and a way of us to kind of reach out to people and tell people a little bit more about what they could be doing or what we know about being in this uh, um, industry, I suppose. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? We we want to um, we want to shed light on a, a few different topics, I suppose. So um, last week's uh, was all about songwriting, and we were trying to give away some of the secrets from people like um, Alex and Liam who are in the band, but also Ryan recording, share some of our stories. And, and we're going to be coming across lots of different topics and try and make it lighthearted and fun as we go along as well. Um, yeah, so, Jay, just off the off the cuff, uh, can we think of something that maybe happen when we first were starting out or even now that might be uh something good to say because i know that that will just spark off with when with the discussion a bit later on with tommy and and teeks so, but every show that we have will have a rep that runs it mm. um, whether that's me or tom uh, or someone who works for us as, as a future sound project or any player person that you play for there'll be someone who's in charge of the show their mm. job really is to make sure that the show runs as smoothly as possible to make mm -hmm. sure that you as an artist uh, or you as a fan has the best possible time, but yeah. obviously that everything's kind of done safely and uh, and that everything uh, from a business point of view also kind of tallies up. So we're looking for someone really who's trustworthy, someone who's good at communicating, someone who's got an air of kind of um, responsibility or, or authority around them, and then someone really, for me and Tom especially, that can can uh, in, the, in their actions fulfill like our ethos for our kind of company which is around making sure that you know people have the opportunity to have a good time and develop and i think on the whole we've um when we haven't run the show we've had so many different people who've been so great at that we've had um harry davis at first who was just like amazing uh we've had george and ethan um teeks uh, we've got Rob from Candy who's running shows as well. Uh, Harry from Riskers has done a few, um, but we, you know, we've worked with so many different people. We've, got, do you remember the time when um, we we asked uh, we were out naming names? We asked that person to run the show. Um, we didn't run the show ourselves because we went to see was it Honey Blood? Yeah, we saw. Oh yeah, I remember Honey that. Blood at Mama Roos, and uh, we had a show at um, the Rainbow Cellar. Um, I remember, I think we watched the first support band at Mamaroos and we were like, let's just go and check how she's doing. 
What happened, Jay, when we returned? Can you remember? Yeah, so we uh, we we got back to the venue, and uh, the first <laughs> thing that happened was I went downstairs, and the laptop that I'd left uh, was uh, just sat there unattended, and and the cash box was open, and I was looking around, and I didn't know where she was, and I asked one of the bands if uh, they'd seen her, and they said, "Oh yeah, she's uh, outside." And I got up, uh, walked upstairs, and she was upstairs. <laughs> Copping off with the lead singer of the uh, main band, so uh, and I think they're eating a bag of chips as well. So um, yeah, yeah. bag of chips and, uh, and having a kiss, and um, yeah, there was no one who was running the show, and people were coming in for free, and and bands weren't getting paid and all that. So the moral of the story is <laughs> make sure that you pick your staff wisely because they're a representative of what you are as a company. I think that's it. I think that's it. Right. Um, should we get the guests on? Should we have a chat? Yeah, yeah, let's go and speak to them. All right, then. Okay. Okay, so now we've got our guests. So, welcome to Teeks and welcome to Tommy. How are you doing? Hello. All right. Hello. <laughs> you all right, Teeks? Teeks, show us what you've got. What have you brought to the party today? Um, so, I've got um, some cider. Lovely. Brother's toffee Lovely. apple, for anyone that's not viewing this. <laughs> and then I've also got a bottle of wine. I've got another bottle like downstairs, but I, I doubt we're going to get through that. Bloody hell, how long are you expecting? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tix has gone because Tix has fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and I Tommy, can't, got I can't see Tix, you know. Oh. Oh. No. Oh. no. Probably for the best. <laughs> <laughs> so. Tommy, what have you got there? I just saw you take a little... I've got an iron brew. Right. <laughs> Not as hardcore. Yeah. I've got a crab... I've got a... Um, it's a Granny Smith apple the, um, sort of cider down there. That I might have that in a bit. Very nice. Yeah, oh, so here we get. Scottish, are you? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Just best pop, isn't it? Best Indeed. of pop. Um, uh, anyone that can't see this, you or if you can, you can see that Tommy's got one of the most... Well, this, this sounds like a euphemism, but one of the most impressive microphones I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Looks really lovely. Um, very large. And James, how are you, mate? I'm okay, mate. How are you? I'm all right. Um, I'm not too bad. I'm excited for this, I have to say. I'm excited for this one. Um, so, starting with you, Teeks. Teeks, um, when did you start repping? Um, uh, yeah, tell us Tell us. Yeah, tell us a bit more about yourself, Teeks. So, I started repping uh, three years ago. I met my former boss on a uni school trip. Um, okay. Went around, like, the venues in Birmingham. And <laughs> I thought you were going to say something else then. But I yeah. thought you were going to or something. <laughs> <laughs> I met him at the farm. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Matt. Yeah. Go on. Maybe who doesn't know? Um, it was Carlo Salazar. Yeah, yeah. Um, so promote. yeah, like got chatting to him, uh, expressed an interest in like you know working the music industry. So he was like, "All right, so you can do the doors for me." And then from there, it just kind of escalated more and more responsibilities to the point where I was the lead rep for Birmingham Promoters, and then. I went freelance for a bit um, and then found myself tour managing a band. Um, so that was fun. This year I was meant to do like a Germany tour, a Switzerland tour, um, a spring tour for the UK and an autumn tour for the UK. But obviously because of the situation, it's all been postponed till next year. I have so. to say it takes quality timing on when to become a tour manager. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> But no, that's that's like a, a real coincidental way of falling into it, I suppose, wasn't it really? Like um, just bumping into someone and having that conversation and then kind of just finding out that I presume that you, you love doing it and then that just spiralled from there kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I absolutely love the fact that, you know, I had the opportunity in the first place and mm. then finding out that, like, I absolutely love live music. So it's pretty much what I want to do for the rest of my life. Uh, after the whole thing is you know <laughs> yeah yeah and tommy so tommy you're uh you're in ba- you're in a band now at the minute yeah new righteous mood um, the one, yeah but you've been in bands as well uh so tell us your story um started out originally local bands so it was corelli and the lodgers my first bands then yeah. I did a band called wide eye that did relatively well um yeah. then end up playing the twang not. for a couple of years and um, god and god you, you, know, you can't <laughs> just say 
couple of bands, you know, did this, did wide eye, did the twang, you know. <laughs> I just, just let that. So yeah, that pretty that must have been pretty cool, mate. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, it was uh, the good guys. They taught me a lot. I learned a lot through playing with them. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then moved on to doing a band called Gleam for a bit, and then yeah. now doing yeah, New Rock Just Mood. And uh, how are you finding being in in the new band? You 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 hadn't been Gleam for what a couple of years, I suppose, was it? Yeah, but probably about a year. We didn't we. Well, yeah, sort of about that, yeah, because we didn't really do anything for the last year of Gleam anyway. We just put mm. that EP out, and then it was like, just, oh, we got, we saved some money up, we had the songs, and we like, better yeah. time recorded than not, I guess. So, right. yeah. yeah. But yeah, uh, loving the new band, yeah. So, new um, tune's brilliant. We used it oh, for cheers, the, uh, the bit of, a, of an advertisement. Well, we used both of them, actually, to be fair. Um, oh, brilliant. It, yeah, <laughs> I hope you don't mind. But yeah, just whack that on the uh, on the, on the the poster for getting the questions for this one. Um, right, for the royalties payout, right? It's all, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, no, 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 7p from Spotify or something, yeah. Uh, Jay, how do we get into it, mate? Do you want to explain that? How do yeah. we get into doing this? So, uh, me and Tom were in a band uh, years and years and years ago, um, and um, we used to book our own shows um, locally, um, and then that kind of turned into uh, something that was called Dakota Beach Presents, which was essentially we used to promote at the New Hampton Art Centre. I think uh, Wide Eyed played that, didn't they, Tommy? We did, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Enough. How weird yeah. circles. <laughs> and so, um, yeah. yeah. That's it, yeah. 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 In Wolverhampton, there's like lots of kind of bands who kind of like uh, started out on those types of nights, and there wasn't a lot going on in Wolverhampton, I suppose, at, uh, at the time. And um, so we promoted them, and basically, the, as a band, we'd promote the show, we'd work the show all together, and kind of like did all the different parts. And then when we split up as a band, me and Tom kind of just decided that we'd keep going and doing it. So essentially, we didn't really realize that like that reps were kind of a thing. We just kind of thought, well, if this is our show, we have to work it and we have to do this, that and the other. So, um, <laughs> started doing that. And strangely enough, we used to have this rule that where we used to say that we both would have to work the show together. Um, and it ended up just being like a lot of the time that we just turn up and just have a laugh and take like the piss out, out of each other all night. And, but then actually grew to really enjoy doing what, what we were doing. And, um, and, um, yeah, kind of like moved over to Birmingham, worked in a venue called Talk originally, which I don't know if anyone remembers, but it was a... Uh, yeah, definitely remember the Talk days. <laughs> yeah. on, for anyone not knowing what Talk is, so Talk was a venue on Corporation Street, Birmingham. Um, uh, flexible rules, I would say, on pretty much <laughs> everything. I think that's the nicest way I could say. Anything kind of went, really, anything goes flexible rules um the funny enough the owner of the of the place um who we grew to well we, we grew to love him he uh he didn't like the fact that anyone would bring in any bags caps he had the real thing for like bands with bags like or, or fans with bags like no so he had probably the most profitable um cloak room that i've ever known because he would like literally charge two pound a bag one pound and one pound a scarf one pound a hat one pound a, and jay it was it was incredible wasn't it <laughs> and it was like as much money off the cloak room as you made off of oh, the bar but i suppose working for there was like as as like a rep you have to do everything from run b security which obviously was really lax um kind of like let people in um, do the cloakroom, but also at times if you run out of beer, you have to go to the like, off license and literally buy beer from Asda yeah. that he would then sell inside the thingy. So, um, and then kind of like we just kind of then we kind of started promoting at some more. Um, do you, can you remember why that was, Jay? Do you remember why we started promoting at more reputable places? Do you remember the story with that? Yeah, so we so we had the Sherlock's booked to play for us, and two days before the venue closed. apparently we had a phone call on the night saying uh got a real problem you know you know that gig that you reckon's got a lot of people to come yeah 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 i don't know if it can happen why and the venue's like underwater what (laughs) Um, and so we that bringing carlo back into the mix takes we we remembered carlo from our playing days and we were just like we need a venue in birmingham nah sorry lads can't help you 
There's 200 tickets sold. Yeah, I can help you, lads. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds <laughs> like him. Worked. And he was like, have the Rainbow Courtyard. So the Rainbow Courtyard practically sold out. And then um, and then we were booked in every week from there on in for, until the Rainbow closed. And that, that was, no, it was amazing, really, wasn't it, Jay? Good times, really good times. And that's kind that's of... Kind of like, I suppose, like, as a time in, like, when we were obviously trying to do stuff, it was like... Uh, a lot of the kind of stuff we like had about repping is about me and Tom kind of like have, having a laugh and some of the stuff that happened. But also, it was a really good grounding of around, I think, our ethos. And I don't know if this was with you, Tommy, but like kind of like being in a band was like we want to actually put on shows and, and, and do things that actually if we were in a band that we'd want to play. Yeah. Um, kind of like, and that was kind of our kind of ethos moving forward was that, look, um, what can we do to try and make this as kind of enjoyable for people to come and play as uh, as possible, and then when we now don't work as many well, we don't really work that many shows at all. We've got families and this, that, and the other, so it's difficult for us to kind of like do that kind of thing. We only really want to have reps who work for us who have that kind of ethos as well, because um, and obviously, takes you've done loads of shows for us recently, and to- Tommy, you've done a few for us as well. But it's kind yeah. of like it's kind of about. Realistically, it's trying to make things as personable as possible. I, I personally think, and um, yeah, it's supposed to be fun, isn't it? You know what I mean. That's what we're all doing. It really. It's not a. Uh, if we were after big books, it wouldn't be uh, getting involved in the music industry, would it? Really. It's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly that. And um, talking about that, then I think that brings us on to the next subject. Really, so Jay and I have dabbled, and I mean dabbled, um, in. Um, Finishing that sentence is really important. Mate. Yeah, I'm going to finish that sentence. And um, we we've dabbled in uh, touring acts, very limited experience. You guys are a much wealth of knowledge and much um, better people to speak to about the differences in terms of repping, working a show, uh, which are both local bands or touring bands. So. What would you say the key differences are? We'll start with Teeks first, and then and then Tommy. And we'll we'll just we'll just chat it through. Um, key difference for me is the tour manager. Yeah. Um, you get two types. You get yeah. the one that comes in, all smiles, really lovely, and that makes you want to literally give them everything you've got and yeah. make sure that they're happy throughout the whole thing. Yeah. And and you've got the other kind, um, to put it lightly, they probably have been in the business for way too long and probably getting sick of it. So, yeah, it's it's interesting to see that. And also, you know, I started all of this is because I'm a fan first. So yeah. what better way to just be fangirling hard with, you know, touring bands that you've heard of or loved their music um, as well and watch their show for free. Oh, actually, getting paid for it. Which is yeah. like even <laughs> That's the best thing about Teeks, I think, is Teeks, if she really likes a band, will then buy the T-shirt, you know, buy, you know, go and onto their merch and 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 really like embrace that and talk to the bands. I think that's a really interesting point, Tom. Can you add a bit more and explain what's the role really of, of the touring manager on a on a show and and how you have to deal with them as a rep? How does that kind of how does that work? Tom or Tommy? Tommy. Oh, okay, so I didn't know if you meant you then, Tom. Um, basically, it's so you're saying how they how to how they deal with. Sorry, you yeah, say so the how, question. How does, how, what's the role of the tour manager? And, yeah. And then, as the rep, what's the what's your responsibility and how you deal with them? So the tour manager, their job is to route the tour, look after the band, make sure they're up, make sure they're going, make sure they're where they should be when they should be. I love that. Yeah. Um, it's actually in the Twang's case <laughs> back in the day, but yeah, make sure they're awake and we're all yeah. on time. Um, and then also then your job as the rep is to, to liaise with them to make sure that they've got everything they need, that they're happy with everything, that there isn't any problems okay. that you can see. You know, um, I'm an yeah. coming, don't you? Go on. So, Teeks, you hinted about the two types, and obviously, it's really nice to hear about the smiley, the smiley tour reps. But have you had a real difficult one? And if so, without naming names, can you could you maybe tell us a little bit about a story, perhaps of, or or just with any anecdotes to do with that? Um. Okay. So I guess I should explain first that before the show happens, there are these things called uh, advances. 
yeah. um, in which there are communications between the parties um, where they would pretty much organize everything beforehand, you know, everything that they need, everything that is required from the venue, everything that, you know, like tech-wise and that's everything normally else. normally done in an email, isn't it, Teach? Yeah, just so people know. That's normally an email that basically says all of that, isn't it, beforehand? Yeah. Um, and there have been probably a handful of times when they were probably asking a lot more than they should be on the day. Right, okay. okay. So, yeah, so that's pretty difficult for a rep, especially when, you know, you can't really leave the venue. You kind of have to be there because you're representing the venue. And they're asking for this and that and this. And um, there was this American band that came to um, a show that I repped. And (laughs) just before they came on, the bassist uh, went to the bar manager and just went, um... Hi, um, could could you just give me a shot of whiskey before I go on? And we're just there like, <clears throat> you've got a bottle of whiskey upstairs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can't just be expecting stuff for free. And obviously the tour manager was like there by side of stage waiting for them. So there was a little bit dispute over that afterwards. But we got it all sorted. It's, it's all good. Is. Tell me, what about you? Any any, any nightmares? Yeah, oh, or, or got... how you've been a nightmare as the twang on the <laughs> other foot for a talk, for you know for a rep. I don't know. You tell me. Well, they'd all sort of calmed down, so I was like, I think I was like in my real nightmare days. To be honest, when I was doing that, so uh, <laughs> they I was probably the nice. pain in the ass. To be honest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i've never had any real bad not that i can think of not that it's coming to my head um any real terrible ones i've always had sometimes like you start off talking to him and you think oh this guy's gonna be a dick right and then after <laughs> after an hour or two they're like coming up and like, once they're banded on they're usually happy so like they're all right by the end of the night like it's but, just um, someone's stress isn't it i suppose and that- yeah you just want that. it to go well don't you like everybody does it's just uh yeah you, it's someone's a bit heightened stress makes you a bit Mm. I don't know, cranky. <laughs> Teeks mentioned about um, demands. Uh, we weren't used to that, were we, Jay? We, we worked with a couple of sign bands. We weren't used to the rider that we used to get sent over on the advance. And um, I think in our younger days, we were a bit, a bit more like a bit more naive to the rider side of things. Jay, do you want to? Uh, yeah, so want I think to... <laughs> in, in into context when we were a band. Um, we sold out the academy too, and didn't ask for a rider. So, <laughs> like, like we like did like a lot, like almost a thousand tickets to uh, the uh, Warfront and had to beg for a crate of beer. So we just didn't. We, we were feeling naive about how things work, really, and kind of like we were just like, like would take whatever we had, and if we got like a pizza or something, we were really happy. And if we didn't, then we wouldn't kick off about it. So, um. We got sent for this rider from one um, from one young touring band, and it literally was like it was like basically looking at like someone's like a school, like like say a fifteen year old's ideal kind of shopping list. It yeah. was like invaders, bottle of coke, um, kind of like um, it, it actually was a twenty four pack of Coca Cola, um, and it said brackets full fat. <laughs> <laughs> Like, uh, like 24 packs of walkers and all this kind of stuff so we went and bought it and it had just put beer and so me and Tom just decided to go and get Carlsberg because we were just like well it's a couple of quid cheaper than thinking and although we shouldn't have done that we did it like um, and so we just took it all about I sent my wife upstairs and told her to like just send it all in and she like she like walked in with all this like you know sweets and all this kind of kind, kind of stuff <laughs> but um but um Basically, when we went to rebook them, um, they basically turned around to us and said, uh, we're really happy with the show, did loads of tickets, we're really happy with, with the way it went. But um, by this point, they got a manager, and he goes, but the lads told me that the uh, rider wasn't very good. And I was like, you know what? And he was like, well, we sent everything on, not the list. And they were like, yeah, yeah. They expected to get a hot meal, and all you gave them was like a pick and mix and a bloody... Uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the best quote... The best quote was, um, the thing is, lads, is uh, unfortunately, I quite like Carlsberg, but it's just not quite Carlin. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Um, the the other one we got sent was um, probably about a year and a half ago, and, uh, and, and we were less educated as we now are on... Um, the problem is, is, 
me and Tom are obviously from the black country, and 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 and, and so like, <laughs> what, and our, our upbringing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying sometimes like these things like like we're not as switched on to some, to certain things, and like yeah. they 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 expanded to that they they were vegan and. Obviously, you don't have hummus down the mines, did you, mate? <laughs> no, no, no. You don't get it off the cut either, Tommy. <laughs> um, well, um, they said they, they were vegan and they wanted a vegan meal. And me and Tom were like, it was like the biggest thing ever. Like, how are we going to find a vegan meal? Like, we obviously are not vegans. You know what I mean? Like, almost like it, they, they had asked for, like, something from the moon. And we were like, how are we going to do So we found this vegan meal and they wanted some alcohol and we got all the alcohol. Anyway, we'd... Uh, um, where we bought the alcohol, we we bought them Carlin, and uh, yeah, it's, 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 we learned our lesson, haven't we, Jay? To be fair, we, 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 lesson. we don't buy Carlsberg. We have to go with Carlin, and uh, apparently Carlin um, contains fish eggs, so, whale whale guts or something. Yeah, so now we like going. Carlin's not vegan. We're like, oh, you are. Yeah, there's no magic in that. There, there has been a time where, like, I think I remembered it was my first ever like touring show that I was repping. And anyway, like, Carlo was checking up on me, and he was just like, have you got the ride in? I'm like, yeah, 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 all good. Showed him the receipt, and he was like, you bought Carlo? Go back and find something else. And I was just there like, why? It's, it's beer, isn't it? And he was like, no, 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 you want good beer, never shit beer. <laughs> and this is why being from the black country, Carlo in the black country is good beer, you know what I mean? <laughs> it hasn't got super at the end, which means it's it's a good, it's an all right thing to, to serve for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was like really clueless at this point. So <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> I think it's just one. It's just all learning curves, isn't it? And and another part of running this show because I, when I was thinking about this, Jane, I was thinking about ideas. It's there is this part which is kind of like a closed curtain for people that just turn up and watch the gigs. If you're not in bands, you don't realise that sometimes you know local bands i'm talking i know it can be earlier with touring bands but you know sometimes you'll turn up at four five o'clock and you the doors don't open till half past seven say what goes on before that there's the you know there's the sound check um to be honest there's a conversation all about sound engineers isn't there when you <laughs> when you run a show because there are there are many um Many very happy sound engineers, shall I say, <laughs> yeah, who you have to work with. Um, and, you know, they're a breed in themselves, and that might be a good podcast to do another time. Um, but it's just, there's just so many interesting little little parts that people don't get to see. It's it's just, you know, it's fun. Have you got any, any stories, maybe, that we, we can tell, perhaps, about bands, how they turn up at Soundcheck, or things that have gone really wrong or even, I suppose, on the flip side is um, kind of like how for some bands starting out, what 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 is a an ideal example of what you'd expect a band to be able to do when they turn yeah. up? I suppose not down a load of points. Definitely not that one. It's best yeah. <laughs> say the drinking till after if you can. <laughs> Whenever you see that, like either a band's turned up with their own booze, or a band's turned up with kind of like the mission to get absolutely smashed. That you don't need to that, yeah. <laughs> the audience has got the, uh, you know, the, the and, and like you, and I, I like you will have known this yourself, but you, you, you kind of watch the situation unfold and you're like, in soundcheck, this band might sound really, really good, but they've now got probably four hours until they end up going on stage. And by the time they get on stage, they're going to be way too smashed to be able to do this, that and the other. So I think that's one thing that a lot of young bands do um kind of like i suppose they they you know it's all about enjoying themselves and this that and the other but i think sometimes they they might get carried away with the kind of this is what you have to do when you play a show mm -hmm. i think sometimes yeah you know, actually the better bands don't actually even though they might walk on stage with a couple of cans of beer or whatever they they generally actually know what they're doing when they are doing it i suppose yeah <laughs> so, but it's like it's the myth isn't it it's like the rock star that's getting wrecked and you know it's like uh you see that a lot of the touring acts all won't be doing a lot of that sort of stuff but you definitely see it from locals yeah. uh sleepyheads are you guys know well they're like <laughs> then used to just get wrecked before every gig like and then he'd be like i've done it again like and uh but like no i know he doesn't he doesn't drink that much anymore but he used to, he used to always have a laugh with ben he'd just be like i've always done somebody's shoulders like what was i doing <laughs> like, 
<laughs> the best thing about them though is um they're in the fortunate position that no matter how smashed they got they were still better on guitar than uh, me yeah so yeah like, they're brilliant as well so brilliant actually, they can kind of get away but it's do you remember the time jay when um so when we first started the band i was only 16 and um we played the island bar uh was it the island but it was on it jay upstairs in the island bar and uh I was like nicking off the rider, like even though I was 16 in an 18 venue, whatever. And um, I remember I carried on a Marshall amp J to play, yeah, and I was yeah. like shouting just as we were about, it was only about our fourth ever gig. And I was going, Jay, Jay, help me, help me. And Jay was like, What? Like a annoying little brother, you know. And he, I was like, my, my amp doesn't sound right. Anyway, Jay came over and went, That's not your amp. <laughs> I <was> going, <laughs> just a cab. <laughs> I've got, got someone else's amp out of the out of the stage room and like the other band on and I just plugged it in because and that just shows you when you when you really don't know what you're doing and you you've had a drink then I've got I've got a classic mate right, when uh you can still find the review as well um my old band supported the vouch at an EP launch in Chadsmore and Canuck um yeah. and then there's a like a this it says something like the cocky boys took to the stage with jeans at half mass because you know when we used to have the jeans like really yeah. low and stuff then yeah. and then uh it goes uh I can only just dis- I can't I can't remember the exact words you can find it just google it like and then um it's the something name. like yeah. <laughs> the um the guitar i can only express my dismay at the guitarist handling the situation because I, I went to the big i was just drunk i went to this massive run so that like we ain't playing here until the sound gets sorted and all this and like my guitar lead was just not connected somehow but send and just walked in plugged it on and then uh, you know, <laughs> hey, so, yeah. I find this what, what do i google i think it's like the lodgers the vouch ep release that should find it yeah <laughs> You, you you were one of them like you were that's the problem we've all done it um we had the talking about sound engineers we we had the one didn't we joe with the um our bass player was just like and he was so talented to be honest way talented than than, than us pair and he was like he was going and you're going lads this is honestly dreadful we're playing in derby he's like rrr, rrr. And anyway we brought the sound tech over and what did he say Jay? You he, said, uh, he said mate this bass amp uh, sounds like a wet fart <laughs> uh, sound engineer went um, <laughs> he said uh, we've had that bass amp for 10 years I reckon there's been 2,000 acts that have played on it and there's only been one wet fart and that's you <laughs> It's <laughs> amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it was just like yeah, funny stuff, but um, absolutely brilliant. What other stuff do you think? So I think with local bands, I think we obviously deal with uh, or, or or work with a lot lot of bands who are kind of um, just starting out and uh, probably a little bit less experienced that would probably play for for one of the other promoters. And our issue is they like, is potentially bringing the gear and stuff like that. And then had to sort out a lot of the kind of kind of complications that happen around kind of when someone hasn't bought this or someone. And I know Tiggs, there's many times that you've texted me and said, "Has anyone actually bought a drum kit, or has anyone bought just trying to have a bought a pedal and this, that, and the other?" And I can remember one day again talking about Carlo. Like me and Carlo were at a show at the Sunflower Lounge, and no one had bought the kit at all. And so me and Carlo were like driving around middle of Birmingham about half past six, trying to find where. His old kit had been sourced, and there was a bit in the. Uh, I remember that kit, man. A bit, a bit in the actress, a bit in the sunflower lounge, and a bit in the uh, down the uh, flapper. But um, <laughs> to me, as like a rep, all, 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 we send an email out now, which basically says, "This is everything that you need. We want the money to be, you know, you need to bring the ticket money in. You need to be a sound check on time." And I know from being in like a band, like by the time we got to the end of the band, as stupid as this sounds. We didn't actually use the sound check ourselves. We used to pay someone to come and sound check for us, so we didn't have to do it because we used to hate spending time with each other. I don't know, <laughs> a bit weird, but um, or hate the sound check. Really negotiating, and it's trying to. It's easier for work, isn't it? You know, like you can still work your your normal shift until five o'clock. If the sound checks at three or four, then if you get someone to do it for you, but. You know, when you when you're trying to manage the tea, that was that. But we also thought we were really cool because the guy who did that was a guy called Kurt, who we we met actually when we were repping, running a show, and and he was his name was actually Kurt Max, and he was from um he was from Venice Beach, uh, Los Angeles, and we just loved the fact that we had some 
like guy in his 50s who had that accent knocking about with us like setting up like it was really cool we also when we used to do shows at new well we'd still do but we put shows on new hampton he used to compare between the bands so he would like i don't know if he, he might have done it he might have done it for you so he might have gone like um that was a super performance from wide-eyed stay tuned folks because coming up next we've got jump the shark <laughs> it was absolutely it was just immense, wasn't it? To be fair, but um, yeah, like just just really good. So, what attributes takes then? So, because takes, it's fair to say you're you're shit hot in organisation and things like that. And um, what attributes are you looking for in the perfect band to um to work, work with when you rep the show? Um, okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Mike. Uh, don't know. I'll turn mine off now. All right, sorry, yeah, there was feedbacking a little bit. So, in short, um, good, but not a diva. Uh, you're on mute. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good, but not a diva. Because you can get, like, you know, the less experienced bands, but actually all the attributes that they have is really professional. And, you know, they're there, they're, they're there on time. They're, like, the first one there, even though they're the first one on. Um <clears throat> they've got all their kit with them they're like really happy they've got the ticket money you know all organized for you and I'm like this is great and they're like oh yeah this is our first gig because obviously they're trying to make a good impression yeah. but then you have you know local bands who have been around the circuit for a long time they know they're good they've got a good following but every single time they're playing at the Sunflower Lounge they're about an hour late and they're headlining so yeah, organisation is key, and if you're playing at the Sunflower Lounge, leave probably two hours before you're meant to leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially a Friday night. <laughs> yeah. So, Tommy, what about you, mate? What, what, um, when you're repping, what, what do you think are like the key things? Just that yes. you look for in a band. If everything's, if everything's been done in done. advance as it should mm. be, then like it should all be fine. Um, so as long as they're following to letter what what's on there, like I'm same as you guys in my shows with Kitsu, like I make sure that everybody knows about everything for the playing. As long mm. as they're following that and they've read for everything, it's all good usually. It's uh, when they're not, it's when like you know people are like, oh I didn't see, that. oh I booked a gig a week after all, you know what I mean all these sort of stuff. You're like oh god, you know, <laughs> try and make it as easy as you can. I think the more communication you have and the more people are, are like are listening to what you're saying and, and you're yeah. Be able to be aware of the problems the better really isn't it it's, uh, yeah. it's when people don't listen <laughs> it's the, the problem the, the yeah. other thing that we were talking about was we because now um if we if we go to if we go to our shows we we don't rep them we will go and still pay the rep and we'll just go and enjoy them and um, but what we what we wanted to know from you guys is we know that we'll be sat wherever we are on, on that what friday night say and we'll be texting for updates probably every 20, 30 minutes. Um, I can't imagine any other promoters doing that, really. I might be wrong, but how is that different? So working with us, how is that different? Because obviously we'll, we'll go, yeah, what's the update? Or how's it going? What was that set like? Blah, blah, blah. How's sound check? Is that, is that different into how you work for other promoters or is that the same? It's the same, same. Um, um, even if it's, if it's net, net or uh, SJM or, you know, Birmingham promoters, they would literally be pinging on my phone, being, what's the update? What's the sales? How's everyone? How's everything? What's the sound? And I'm just there like, leave me alone and let me do my job. Like, <laughs> we're, we're, just trying to, we're just trying to be nice, you know, just trying to... <laughs> non taken yeah <laughs> where was it it was at mamaru and you were like how's it going teeks and i think i was busy like you yeah. know sorting things out um yeah. and then you kept messaging me and i was just like the venue's burnt down <laughs> yeah, you did. You did actually write that what? yeah that that's because the thing is jay we're, we're very protective aren't we and, and with that show in question without naming names it was a worrying show. We 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 didn't know if Teeks had been taken hostage or you know. <laughs> had burnt down in Vermont. <laughs> the venue could have burnt down. So yeah, that was it. A value, uh, uh, a, a natural text that could have been sent on that night. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been believable. <laughs> it really would have. But um, yeah, that was that was that was interesting. We had uh, three members of staff for that show. It just as reps. Um, yeah. So. 
moving swiftly on. <laughs> um, Tommy, have you ever done anything like a, any themed sort of nights before? You ever done anything like a, a themed night? We used to do, me and Kez used to go, if you guys out there know Kez Hanley, who used yeah. to do um, Hey Honey, well I think he still does do stuff with Hey Honey, but he mainly works for Bitters and Twisted now, do the Vic um, and whatnot. But um, yeah, we used to do this thing called Club Lamore, it's like Club Night we did together, and we used to do themes for that, so we'd do... I think we did like a dance one one night, like trance sort of thing. And then we do like, because it was normally an indie disco. Yeah. Um, we did things for Halloween and yeah, I've done like some Halloween gigs and stuff. Yeah, we used to have a go at some different things. But how about you guys? Have you done much uh, theme sort of stuff? Or? Um, we, oh. <laughs> we were a little bit worse than that. So um, we um, used yeah, to that do... Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that sounds quite cool. Yeah. yeah <laughs> you, like Star Wars or something. <laughs> <laughs> and because and to try and spice them up, um, we um, I like that spice. <laughs> yeah, we 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 used to have a theme, and then we used to get people to come dressed as that theme. So we had um, a Mexican night, and we <laughs> sold, <laughs> and we sold mustaches, <laughs> and we had yeah, beach party. <laughs> we had a beach party, and um, and we wore beach shorts and vests. Yeah. Um, Nicky Barb for that one. Nicky Barb did the events. We did. It, mate, to be fair, that was deep. they used to pull in loads of numbers. So I don't know why we stopped. <laughs> it's all right. But, um, one, one of our jobs when we used to rep our first shows was um, at these... Um, so, our oh, mom, our mom had this idea. This is so this funny. Is, this is really embarrassing. I'm actually going red and we're not what even... Like do when they're listening to chilled out acoustic music, they'd like cheese and wine. So, me and Tom at the New Hampton... Uh, we made sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> Ham comps on the, uh, yeah. on the bar. Like. <laughs> Ham comps, like, we used to go around and sell them for like £1.50 a go. I promise you, this is, this is how it used to run. So we'd both go to work. At about lunchtime, we'd see which one of us could nip out of work, um, like in our normal jobs um which one could nip out and go and get the the cheese or the ham and the, and the rolls then we'd get them we'd go have one beer at the at the local pub roughly about quarter past four we'd then race home to my mum and dad's use their butter and we'd literally have a line of a, of like i'd do the buttering of the bread joe put in the put on the filling and um we'd make like working at amazon or something yeah <laughs> <laughs> in it, put it in it like set up, like. <laughs> we'd get, like a um a little red riding hood kind of basket <laughs> we'd whack it all in there and then no word of a lie jay i used to I don't know, this is the thing with Jay and I, we'd, we'd kind of make deals, like, you go and sort the band's ticket money out if you sell the cops. <laughs> 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 so, so for me, it was, uh, I'll sell the cops. And, um, yeah, so I was, like, going round to these tables while people were... Put, they put, they put, always used to sell out. I'm not even joking. <laughs> <laughs> After one night, I, I can still remember, I don't know if you remember this, Tom, it was... It was like while the World Cup was on, and like, so you know, like when like you like you're booking or wrapping shows, and if it falls on like a a World Cup Friday, that's a big g- the game that you never yeah. kind of planned it to be, then you're kind of screwed, and then no one's going to turn up. But yeah, we, yeah. Or, we've always sold out of cobs, so even if there's twenty people there, we'll sell these cobs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was like, probably defending the cobs, like. <laughs> and uh, and literally twenty people came. And we had about 40 cobs. And me and Tom just sat at the back with the bar staff. And we were like, literally, we'd eaten so many cobs that we didn't even need a Mackey's on the way home. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sure there's a health and safety viol- uh, violation in there somewhere, isn't there? Like? I think it definitely is. Because um... the worst thing, I'm not even joking. When we came <laughs> over to Birmingham, we actually asked uh, Dom at Thorpe, are we okay to sell cobs? And he was like, okay. He did. He did. <laughs> <laughs> Started at talk. <laughs> we started at talk. We started at talk upstairs, and we did acoustic nights there first, uh, like talk tea rooms, and we did like alcoholic tea and stuff. And I went, oh, that's brilliant because <laughs> because we sell cops at our shows, so that goes really well. And he went, Tom, don't say that again, mate. I was like, what? Like, not bringing any cops into my venue, okay? I was just like. <laughs> Equally, next door there was like a John's, and like, eat the lamp. 
It was like people doing cops for 99p. <laughs> what are we going to sell them out? To be honest, Jack, I, I think like I'm really in the wrong form of work because I could sell those cops. Like, I, you know, geezer on EastEnders at the minute who stood on the market store selling his sandwiches. That would be me. I should, I should literally should just go into cop selling. Um, <laughs> like, Subway nicks your, nicks your idea, didn't they? What's doing that? you in? Subway have done you in. Oh, mate, to be honest, the worst thing was, uh, these cobs were crap, weren't they, Jay? Like, they were, like, <laughs> <laughs> they were terrible cobs, like, I can't even tell you how bad they were. We, we didn't even get our mum to make them, make them nice, it was just me and Tom, like, they were awful. They, but they used to sell out. They used to sell out. The thing that I wanted to just Sorry. ask about. <laughs> the cobs, I, I can't get over it. <laughs> The final thing I, I just wanted to ask about was about this kind of like, this, so, sometimes there's, there's like this unwritten battle that people kind of won't really know about, which is like, so one of the jobs that the rep has to do is they have to sort out all the ticket money before doors. Mm. Um, and there's this kind of thing that happens that normally, or a, a, lot, a, lot, a, a lot of the time, bands will come in and they'll have, and, and they'll have the ticket money and, and, and it's a really easy night. But then you get some acts who will come in and they'll do everything in their power to ensure that they don't have the conversation with you about the, t- uh, about the ticket money. And it's really hard because... <laughs> like, <laughs> like you're trying to sort this out, and I can imagine you've got someone like Tom texting you going, um, have you had all the ticket money in before doors? And you're like going, um, well, I'm trying to, but this band have just like slivered off into the night and no, don't want to talk to me. Because me and Tom always say, you know, if, if bands sell lots of tickets or don't sell lots of tickets, doesn't necessarily matter. The frustrating thing is when people don't tell you what they what the truth is. Because if someone's if you, if you gig like with the cobs, for example, we would have made forty cobs if we realised we had twenty six tickets on. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to see if your cob thing's valid. Still, like, yeah, this is what this whole podcast about. This podcast like, just testing cool. the ground to see if cobs. Yeah, <laughs> have, have you ever made cobs? Um, <laughs> So, There's tags on YouTube though with people searching cobs. When I put tags, bloody hell! Yeah, it's a good keyword. Yeah. Sponsored by Hovis. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, what's so to so to teach? I suppose what's the difficulties in that kind of situation, or 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 or, or like how how do you deal with that? I suppose. Um, I've had um a lot of sort of perspective outlook on this um so i figured out that bands who you haven't you know kept the relationship going throughout loading through sound check through doors they're the ones who keeps quiet and sort of slivered off or you know all the rest of it so what i try to do 100 percent of the times is when they come is to have a chat with them, to get to know them, like they wouldn't necessarily have met you before. But you need to a you know you need to be your best friend and be a representative of the promoters first, um, so that they're comfortable enough to tell you the truth. I guess going back to your point, mm-hmm. and you know to talk to you about ticket money and stuff. Um, but the best way is to just sort of ask them after the sound check because they can't really go anywhere because they're taking their kit off so once they take the kit off you're right there and you're going okay. takes corner room. By what you mean by they've taken <laughs> the kit off <laughs> nowhere to go nowhere to hide we don't have chippendales <laughs> performing <laughs> that. taking like, all their gear like their equipment <laughs> off of the stage no, not you. their clothes because that would be really really bad <laughs> Tommy's microphone nearly dropped off then <laughs> <laughs> I'm just realised how bad that sounds, but uh, yeah, taking their equipment off of the stage. That's yeah. just only better in fairness. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Before we wrap up, I've just seen the time talking so much about cobs. Um, before we wrap up, we've got a couple of questions that I, I did promise I would ask. So, um, the first question I believe is a fake account because it said, "Do you like fashion?" So, um, I believe that must be a fake account. So, thank you for that question. Uh, number two. Um, What's the best way to get support slots alongside a touring band? Tommy Greaves. Impress the promoter. Do the right things. Like, A, be good. 
that always helps. But then be like nice guys <laughs> and, you and don't wish it. So <laughs> <laughs> and like take all your shows seriously. Don't have one show where you're like pushing it really hard, and the next show you bring five people, and because it's like the promoters putting their money on the line. You know, you've got a you still got to pay the engineer, you still got to pay the venue, you still got to pay all your marketing. You know, so it's like you know that guy's or girl is get putting their money up you know you've you've got to respect it a bit and if you you know if that's where you're at that's where you're at but mm. if you know if you fluctuate in that much train shows it's never like the kind of thing where you're going to be like oh that band's growing that one's going there you know i think the best way of showing that you're growing for <clears> me <throat> is spread out your shows it's better to sell two fifties so bring 50 people to two shows um over say five to uh, like a four month period in your hometown then play a show a month and sell a 10 each week because it shows that you've got hype if you want to play every week I'd, I'd go out go and play the local the surrounding area of the midlands london manchester and, and go and get experience of playing in front of a crowd that's never heard you before because that's the way you improve ultimately yeah. um, but i think i think that i think that's exactly it, what, what you said um the other question is um and Tom, this might be a, another question for you because of your answer about what you did with Kez. But Big Sky Orchestra. So that last question from Elisa May, thank you. A great artist, by the way, as well, to be fair. Um, Big Sky Orchestra says, um, thoughts on bringing back live music club nights? Have bands play till later and longer? Ah, uh, if I was a young, like I'm, I'm, I know I look like a child, but I'm 30 now. I'm like, uh, I'm not the same kind of temperament, I guess, when I was younger, and I wanted to be out all the time. And like, yeah, I think if you're that kind of person, to get a club night going. I mean, there's no, there's nothing stopping these bands or anybody doing it. I don't fancy doing it again because you're up till bloody whatever time, and you need assistance for that sort of stuff. And yeah. <laughs> no, I, I don't have assistance true. anymore. So. Yeah. Well, we we played it. We played a great one in Glasgow, and I think we went on stage at about half eleven, um, and then it just you know came on to a bit of a club night afterwards. I think there's room for it, but I think that it must not be as popular as people might think it would be, because otherwise people would be doing it. Perhaps yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know. Takes you ever? Do you fancy putting your hat in the ring for doing a uh, a club band night one day? Um. I mean, if the venue curfew allows it, because that's also a big sort of, you know, barrier to mm. see if they are licensed to have live music until late. Usually it's 11 o'clock, so... Yeah, that's it. That's the thing, isn't it? That's um, like it and see. We used to have, like, bands on at, I think, like, 3 o'clock in the morning, half two, something like that. <laughs> it was, it's good at Club Lamar. <laughs> good, uh, good night. That, what, what, that place closed down, didn't it, about three years ago, maybe? He's still, he's still running. He's got, is he? Uh, he, he was always but, drawing bass. It was always drawing bass, really. And then we come in... Well, I ended up doing a show there for a guy called George Paul, who's in The, yeah. the Assist. Yeah. Um, and um, I did a... We, he booked us to play there. We was doing uh, Gleam, I think. And I looked around yeah. and I was like, this is perfect for a club night. Like, So me and George got talking. We ended up doing something there for a bit. Then Kez got involved a little later and then... Kez made it what it was really we kind of yeah. just set the grounds up but um yeah yeah it's yeah it's perfect location but he'd never done anything like that before so it was like if we all kind of testing the water i guess mm. no i love it i love it um so i think we've really we've, we've kind of come to come to the end there really um just follow more comments i suppose obviously um with what's going on at the minute with covid19 this has obviously stopped all of us in our in our music tracks i suppose um what what are you doing to keep yourself creative um yeah if you just let us into maybe a bit of that and and any advice you've got for 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 bands or artists that are, are, are stuck really with things to with things to do or whatever else other than listen to this podcast of course uh takes what, what you know, um, take um, actually today after this i will be um organizing <clears throat> a set for a band that I manage called Lilyburn. Um, he's got a live stream show next week on Saturday. So yeah, we're just setting things up. Um, we're Skyping each other and we're working on choreography, working on like the set, how it sounds through Facebook Live and stuff. So that should be good. That, so that will be on the Sunflower Lounge's um, platform as well. So yeah. yes, live gigs is on a halt, but we are now in an age where there's technology and with technology we can still do what we love in 
a different format, but it still works. People are still watching, you know. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing, isn't it? Tommy, what about you, mate? Um, I've been well, obviously rescheduling shows like you guys have as well. Yeah. That. Um. Uh. Right in. Uh, just released our EP with the new right just mood, so yeah. it's worth a listen if you're into the Strokes, Libertines, sort of cribs kind of stuff. That sounds terrible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, like people, I, I paint like as well, it. so yeah. <laughs> we did a bit of painting as well. So yeah, just right, a bit so of... Tommy is an incredible artist. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. <laughs> big mention of his stuff um, on his Instagram. It is check it out. It's really really good. Check the new right just mood, mate. Check Lily Burn, Jay. We'll, uh, we're just we're just carrying on, aren't we? We're just carrying on. I've got to say, I felt a bit inspired from our chat with uh, Alex last week. Yeah. Um, and um, I don't know, I might get some kind of thing to record into uh, to try and record some stuff. I spoke to Dan yeah. today and was saying, send me some lyrics, and then I'm going to get you to write oh, the guitar shit. part. Oh shit! He's getting the band back together. Oh. Yeah, but without us having to spend any time together at all, a virtual band. Virtual, we're like the gorillas. Like the gorillas, <laughs> but um, even more cartoon. Even more hairy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you ever so much uh, for coming on and joining us. It's been amazing to chat with you. Real good laugh. You'll never eat a cob again without thinking of that story. Uh, thanks everyone for listening again <laughs> we've had so many views and, and listens on the Spotify God knows why you want to hear us but if we're making this any better um, for you at home then yeah we're just we're glad to be doing so so we'll see you next time next time we're going to be talking all about promoting shows and um, we're going to have uh, Matt Williams on who is London based working at a record label he's also been um, one of the bookers on, on Royal Albert Hall and uh, we're also joined with the Novus as well who are doing great things uh, DIY so we'll catch you next time thanks everyone for coming see you later <laughs>